the ultimate lesson here is this. Everybody's on their own path. And I don't want to judge someone for wanting to be free and easy. I just want you to understand that there's a cost to that. And the cost that you're going to have to that isn't going to come until later. Most people need to shut the f*** up and focus on that version of themselves they want to become and actually be willing to become it. And that's what's ultimately going to create the fulfillment that you're looking for. It's not going to be your cold plunge. It's not going to be your morning routine. It's going to be the work that you f***ing do to become that version of yourself that is the exact version that you know you're supposed to become and then being proud of it. That's what's going to create the fulfillment that you're searching for. And all of this other shit is just band-aid shit to try and fix something that you know is a real problem in yourself. And today's 75 hard versus is actually 75 hard versus me. And we have as a special guest to help communicate the 75 hard versus story, none other than the person who lives with me and <laughs> shares my house with me and basically knows everything about me so she could tell you all the shit that it's done for me uh, and then ask me some questions. My amazing wife, Emily Frisella. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I was going to say, what else are you going to intro? Like the lady that cooks meals or what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, like, no. who better to know what the fuck's going on than you? No, but that's why I'm excited about this, doing this. And we have talked about this, like wanting to do the show for a while because people don't realize what you tell them, but they don't understand like the nitty gritty. Like you give the macro perspective of like what changed this or that. They don't actually understand like, I'm sorry, you give the macro. I want to give like the micro of like all the little things that I noticed as your wife. But then also I know like DJ as well. You guys, you know, we're doing the program together and you finished phase one, getting ready to start phase two, all of that. So I just thought we'd be able to like cover a lot for people, kind of an all encompassing show because you've never been the feature of any of these Sunny Have Hard Versus shows. So, um, well, we thought, it was two options. It was either me pretend and wear a different outfit and interview myself, <laughs> which we which thought was a great idea. Still on the yeah. table. It's still, yeah, we still might do that. Um, or get Emily, who knows the most about me of any human on the planet, to uh, interview me. Yeah. So. So I think first, though, because if anybody hasn't ever listened to the show, 75 Hard, kind of how it came about. You've mentioned it before in like one or two shows, but tell everybody kind of how 75 Hard came to flourishing like in that January whenever you made that bet and how much this was? Well, when it first started, it was, <clears throat> you know, for me, I've struggled with understanding my whole life, like understanding why certain people had this ability to do things and make it look easy, like stick to a diet or stick to a workout program or follow through. And I was always confused on why people were able to do that. I didn't understand that. I thought people just had that or didn't have that. And so I've always been obsessed to a point with mental toughness and mental, um, you know, discipline and things like this. Like I read all the books. I, 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 I understand what they were saying, but it never really clicked with me. And it still always felt like, you know, certain people had it and certain people didn't have it. And at that point, in the point in my life where 75 hard came around, um, I had just went from one of the hardest times in my life where I had gotten myself up to 350 pounds and I had pulled a bunch of the weight off of, uh, myself through just pushing myself through a, a hard program, but I hadn't really fixed the problem. I never fixed the problem. And I noticed that it was still hard for me to diet and it was still hard for me to eat right. And it was still hard for me to get my workouts in. And um, I wanted to put together a, a program for myself that would help me fix that problem. And, and so I thought about it, I thought about it, I thought about it. And I made a bet with uh, the people in my Arte group. Um, we had an Arte meetup that was 75 days from the time when I started. And I was going to stick to the program for 75 days uh, with no, no compromise, no fail. And a whole bunch of people decided to do it with me. I just announced it on the podcast. And the next day I was starting and a bunch of people started too. And uh, that's kind of how it started. And what I did to come up with the program was I picked the things, the, the items that you know is 75 hard now, you know, eat, eat a clean diet, 
uh, train twice a day, one of them being outside, drink a gallon of water, uh, read 10 pages of personal development and take a progress picture. And the reason that I picked these five things is because these five things were all things that I had found over the course of my life when I had made the most progress that I was doing most of these things, Mm -hmm. all right, consistently. And so I thought and thought and thought and was a student of, you know, what makes and what develops mental toughness and discipline. And really 75 hard was just me running the play that I thought was going to fix the issue in myself. And it just so happened that I said it in public and a whole bunch of people started with me. Yeah. So that's kind of where it started. But something that you just said, you said like the doing the things that you were consistent on that you knew were going to provide a result. And a lot of people may not know, you know, we've been together 15 years and I've seen your weight. When we started dating, you were 330. Yeah, you were 330 pounds. And then you lost a bunch of weight when we went on vacation. Mm -hmm. And then you had gained the weight back to about where were you at three where, where were you at the second time when you gained weight? Because you went up and down about... I think I got up to like 300. Okay. And then I worked back down again. Then you went down. And then I went back up to right. like 350. Exactly. And, and then... And I stayed there for quite a while. Right. So from what I see, that's like you were taking those little lessons like, okay, well, I know this worked the first time I yes. lost weight. And then the second time I did, I was actually adding this in because I added cardio in and it wasn't just weights anymore. So that was a component. So like you going, having those three large scale up and downs the time that I've known you it's like you took pieces and components from each of those lessons that you learned to kind of formulate this program because since you started this in 2019 your weight has not fluctuated at all you know no, you, I've you, continued you, you, to get better continue to get better continue to build more muscle get leaner so it's like I just think that's a, a important point to point out because so many people go up and down in yo-yo dieting and this the way I see it it's like this is what actually got you to stop doing that well th- yeah 100 percent. because yeah. i fixed the problem the problem is not it's not that people don't know what to do it's that people can't do what they know how to do right and that's the problem the problem is you do not have the discipline uh the grit the fortitude the mental perseverance to push through uncomfortable things for a long enough period of time and I, I recognize that because here's what would happen. Like I'd go to dinner with people like, let's say Mike Cunahan, right? Mm-hmm. Or somebody who's walks around for the most part in pretty fucking good shape all the time. And we'd be having dinner and, and you know, I'd look at the menu and I'd, I'd ha- without any control, I'd have to order whatever looked the best for me, right? And I would go to dinner with these people who were my friends who walked around at a high level and they had discipline. They could order a a decent meal that was clean. And yeah, they could have a few drinks, but that was never how I was. I had to eat exactly what I wanted. And then I would drink as much as I wanted because I was telling myself, I'm going to start Monday anyway. So it doesn't matter. So I'm going to try to get this in now. Um, and then on Monday, I'll fix it. And I, that's how I got to be 350. Well, no, and you didn't just tell yourself that. You told me that, I to- too, yeah. would be out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, hey, let's just eat this, and we're going to start. We'll hit it hard tomorrow. And we were like, okay. so then Because you and I, like, people don't, like, we would go out and drink, like, three nights a week. Yeah. We would eat. Or also, when we were, quote, dieting, we would have a cheat day, and it yeah. would be as much as we could fucking eat till our stomachs hurt. Yeah. And we'd feel like shit until Wednesday, get our shit together Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then eat like shit again on Sunday. Yeah. It was a cyclical thing. So yeah. I don't, you know, that's it. I think that's. I just recognized that certain people had the power to make the choice, which I lacked. Yeah. I did not have the ability to say no to someone setting a beer in front of my face. I did not have the ability to look at a restaurant menu and order what I knew I should be eating because of the commitment I made to myself. I lacked that power and I recognized that. And, and so that's where I, I honed in on what the problem actually was. And this is the problem with all of you too listening. Your problem isn't that you don't know what to do, okay? Your problem is, is that you can't fucking do it, which is what the point of the program is. And what this program does is it takes all the components that are basically in every single fucking diet program ever, and it forces you to do them over the course of time without fail for a long enough time that it actually changes what's going on in your mind so that you are now aware because that's what really happens on 75 hard. It's not, it's not that it like rewires your brain. It's that it creates awareness to when you're 
negotiating with yourself and you start to recognize that that negotiation is what's costing you all these things that you actually want in your life. And when you can become aware of when you're negotiating and aware of when you're, you know, compromising and aware of when the bitch voice is winning the battle, which for most people, that's almost all the time. When you could become aware of that, now you're a step closer to actually being in charge of your own mental dialogue and making the proper decisions. And so like I was just where everybody else is. I just wasn't aware enough of the mental conversation that was happening in my brain, the justification of the bitch voice. Nobody can tell, you know, you the shit you need to hear that's going to make you compromise your long-term goals better than you. Like I know exactly what to tell myself. Like yeah. dude, and we all do it. Yep. We, we all We're do so it. so present in those conversations. Bro, too, bro. We, we all do it. Yep. And this is what the program is designed to fix. It's a year-long program. People don't understand that. You know, 75 hard is the first phase. And then there's three phases after that. And you're you're supposed to do this every year, you know. So in every year that I've done it, I've gotten better, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But the point is... Um, I recognize what the real problem is. And the reason there's been millions of people who have had success with this is because this actually addresses the real problem. The real problem isn't that you don't know that you're supposed to drink water or you don't know that you're supposed to eat less calories uh, than, you know, than what you're burning, right? You don't know that you're supposed to lift weights. You don't know that you're supposed to move your body. Like we all know those things, that's common knowledge. But what you don't really understand is that knowing what to do and doing what you know to do are two different skill sets. And the skill set that this program targets and the problem that it solves is the ability to adhere to whatever plan that you decide to put in front of you, which makes you infinitely powerful. Yeah. So you touched on, you know, the the old Andy, let's say the pre-75 hard Andy. So your mindset from like 2010 to 2016, you know, you that's the up and down in weight. It's the, you know, emotion regulation, mm -hmm. drinking, cheat meals, the I'll start tomorrow mindset. So is it just, you know, a lot of people like the picture that, you know, showing now, if you're watching on YouTube. So was there like a certain picture or a moment where you're like, fuck this, I'm done with that? Or what what, what made you get to that point of like? No, it like wasn't it. like that for me. I knew I was fuck. First of all, I was strong. All right. So. I was always the, I was always an athlete and I was always very, very strong. Um, so I built my, my justification upon me being a fat slob, uh, who had no discipline upon the idea of being strong. All right. So when you can lay down on a bench and you can rep out 405 pounds for 20, all right, you're stronger than most people on the planet. Yeah. All right. Now I, all you fucking strong men and power lifters, I understand you're strong too. There's a lot of strong people. Okay. We don't need to whip out our dicks, but I was strong as fuck, yeah. Okay. And the, the, where I had built my identity was on that. So I understood that I was fat, but I also understood that I was strong. So I justified it as okay. You know, like, yeah, you own a supplement company. You're fat. I'm like, yeah, bitch, but I'll fucking lift your house. Yeah, I'll you know, you in a piece of paper. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so like, you know, that's how I always justified it, which was a weak lie that I was telling myself that that kept me in this place where I wasn't happy because dude, nobody knows how unhappy I was more than you. Yeah. Like how many times, like, dude, remember, rem remember the fucking outfit that I used to wear that yeah. what? Yeah. You'd wear your, your t-shirt or your big hoodie and then you'd wear your baggy long cargo shorts what and do you tell the people about the shorts <laughs> so he had these shorts that he would only wear that there was the only pair that he had because he couldn't and i didn't know this when we started dating but it's the only pair you could fit in that's right and that's why you would wear those and i would tease because one day when he when we first met i said oh i like your shorts and then you wore them every fucking time i saw you and i was like okay i told you i liked them i didn't mean like you had to wear them every time <laughs> i thought he was like man like i really i'm glad she likes these i'm gonna keep wearing them i didn't realize they're the only fucking clothes he had to fit in oh, yeah and so as the the shorts would start to tear or get worn out she I would, patch them i patched them i patched those motherfuckers for like two years years oh, and so finally we had to have like a proper burial and move on to a new one pair of shorts that he Which had were, were then camp because those were plaid yeah and then, and then the new camo, ones were camo. camouflage yeah and finally yeah they were getting so thin and worn down the plaid ones that he switched to camo ones and he wore those and i patched those uh, several times and then finally they got to be where you tore them so somehow and they could not be mended and then you had to then you started wearing your mfco short or you know your regular workout shorts yeah. all the time 
and that's really all you wore. And then when we would go out, it would be one pair of jeans and your shirt. And I remember- I would only wear a first form polo because first form made the polos. And back then we actually put them on Under Armour clothes. Mm -hmm. And it was the only thing that like I felt like didn't make me look like fucking fat as shit, but I still yeah. did. Yeah, I just but, didn't. and something that is a little side note or caveat to this, like that I've noticed in your body language over the years, which I know I've said this a long time ago. The but pulling I, on the shirt? Yes. So yeah. what he would always do is he would wear, if he had to wear a t-shirt or even the polos, he would consistently pull on them at the bottom. And so when you would, he would take them off, they'd almost be stretched like out a little bit out a because little bit. he kept pulling at it because he felt uncomfortable in them, even though they weren't too short or anything like that. But do you remember that time we were at my dad's house and we had, he had a barbecue and we left early because of how uncomfortable I was. Yeah, We did that. We did that more than once Yeah, that you would be, just be so uncomfortable and like not feeling good in your skin at all that we would leave places and we wouldn't go on places. We wouldn't go on vacation. You know, it was like you said on the show, like we went on our first vacation since our honeymoon that was back in February. So that was like, We've been married almost 11 years now, but it's like that was 10 and a half years gone by because just the ups and downs. Obviously, we're just not like super vacation -y people either, but it's because. The well, that contributed feeling. to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's just, you know, him feeling so uncomfortable. So when you stop, when I've seen you stop pulling on your shirts, like because that's like something like, yeah. you almost did it like habitually where yeah. you didn't even know you were doing it. Yeah. I could start to tell that you your emotional state was also improving then because you started feeling more comfortable in actually who you were. You know what I mean? What you were like presenting outward. Yeah. Because so Dude, it, but it wasn't a, it wasn't like a picture though. It was, I was tired of feeling like that. Yeah. I was tired of, cause remember when I started with 75 hard, I had already lost a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause I lost, I gritted out a hundred pound loss just like I had before in my life. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I did it the way that we used to always do it where I'd eat clean and then I'd binge, mm -hmm. you know, and then I'd eat clean and I was just stretching out the eat cleans long enough to where the binge wasn't eating it up. Right. Mm -hmm. And that first year that I started dieting in 2016 for real, where I haven't gone back, you know, I lost 110 pounds that year. Yeah. Right. And so then, but it was still hard. Like I still wasn't like cured. Like it wasn't, I was still struggling. Like I was like, I would still go to a restaurant and yeah, I could win the battle. Right. I could order the healthy food, but it didn't like feel natural. Um, it was forced. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like it was a very difficult decision. And that's actually what led me to understanding that this is a mental problem. This is not a physical fucking problem, right? This is a problem that people have to fix in their minds, not in their body. Because I had already kind of fixed it in my body, but my mind wasn't fixed. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so what, that's, that's sort of what created the motivation for me to take it past the level of just physical to the to the mental and and this is why a lot of people have so much uh difficulty understanding the mental that this is a mental toughness program and not a diet right uh or a challenge it's a program it's a program that you put yourself through to make yourself think about things in a different way than you've thought about them previously in your life and this is also why people who do the program the right way see drastic change and people who don't on day 76 they're going right back to their old habits mm -hmm. because they compromise through the whole thing all right and they're pretending because it's a trend mm -hmm. that they actually actually did it. And the reality is, is if you actually did it, you are terrified at the end to make changes because you just recognize how much progress you made. Yeah. Yeah. So the crazy thing is like it's 75 days, but there's like 10,000 battles, mental battles. Bro, it's every day. In the like yeah. multiple a day. Yeah. Multiple a day, dude. That, that, that's a super important point, man. Yeah. yeah. And I think what you said about the mental, mental and physical connection, that's a big thing people, because when people want to lose weight, they think, just physical. I just need to. Which is like we used to think. Well, yeah. You I, we're going on vacation. Let's yeah, get in shape. We were never. We got a wedding. Let's get in shape. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it was always dieting for a occasion. Right. Instead of like, hey, I just want to feel like a mm -hmm. fucking great and tying in that mental aspect of it. I think that changes everything because again, it's like you're not uh, ex, you know, you're not just, it's, it's like, let's say you have a house, you put, it's fallen down. It's like the foundation's crumbling. You can't just put fresh paint on it and new siding and call it new. The yep, inside, the, the actual, <laughs> the, you know, yeah. literal, the foundation is crumbling. That's like the mental state of it. Like you're not fixing what really needs to be fixed first, because if you fix the inside, the outside will happen as well. And I think that's the, that's the biggest thing. Why I love mm -hmm. it. The program as well, because it's all like a mental 
thing because, you know, when with Sloan's accident, I started 75 hard right after it because it was a fucking very hard time. Yeah. And I knew I needed that to snap myself out of it. I had I could care less about any sort of results that I would get. It was just I needed that mental, you know, that mm-hmm. mental focus. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so powerful for that. Yeah, dude, I think I think the main thing that most people need to recognize is that your the state of your life on the ex on the outside legitimately reflects the state of your mental state and we can fake it like we can we can diet and lose weight for a wedding or an event or or we can be productive uh, in business, like I was already very successful in business at this time. It wasn't the craziest part about it. Right, you were doing great. Yeah, but where would I have been if I had figured this out earlier? Yeah, that's yeah, where you got to think touch about on that next. So, yeah. so, so we can fake it. We we can push and we can go through phases and we can like get results. But until you really recognize that this is a true mental issue and that the skills and the reason I call them skills is because they are skills. They are not traits. The skills of discipline, the skills of fortitude, the skill of mental perseverance, the skill of physical perseverance. These are things that you must develop. And the way you develop things is by pushing through hard things. And so when you start to look at it like that and you start to realize that that's the actual problem and that once you fix that problem, now you're able to do all of these other things with literal with literal ease, right? Like without you you now become the person that you always looked at and you thought, "Why do they have these things that I don't? Why is it easy for them and it's not easy for me?" Oh, they have better genetics. No, they fucking don't. They got better habits and they built better skill sets in their own brain. All right. Now, if we're going to split the hair on genetics, sure, some people have better genetics than other people. But you motherfuckers tell it yourself that everybody has better genetics than you and it's not fucking true. And you know how I know you do that? Because that's what I used to do. Yeah. So let's talk about the professional aspect of it. So 2019, you're building this headquarters here. So we're moving headquarters. We were moving into our new house. We, RHA Syndicate was a year old and we were having, um, we moved into our house on May 1st and we had 250 people at our house on May 20th mm-hmm. for a big party. So we were going through all of that. Um, you're running us to doing the podcast, um, all the other businesses and brands that you work with and consult in. So you had a million reasons like to not do this. So how did you prioritize that time or how did you move forward with all of these projects? Isn't it interesting that people say 75 hearts a fad and it's been going for five fucking years. I know. And getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I know. What other fad has done that? A fad is 195 days. Is that, is that the, <laughs> I think I read, yeah, I read an article several months ago and it said, I said, what is the, what is the gauge of a fad? And I think it was like 195 days. And I was like, yeah. we're kind of stretching that quote fad yeah. out there. <laughs> yeah. So like, how do, cause that's the thing is like when you, when people hear this, sometimes they're like, well, I don't, I, that picture bothered me there. Yeah. Yeah. That was a picture that bothered me. Yeah. So this is, that was actually when you met Mike Cunahan when he, uh, when we met him in New York for the first time. No, I met Mike before that. Well, that's when I was with you. Yeah. Right? yeah. And he came, yeah, came back to St. Louis. Yeah. That was, I remember that because that, that was your infamous polo mm-hmm. and I had to keep that thing washed every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that we had two of them revolving at Quality Meats in New York. So when people are always like, well, I've got this going on. I've got this going on. The thing is, is that I know you say on the podcast, like, oh, you know, you're busy, you're busy, but people don't actually understand what the fuck your days look like because every single morning you get up and you ruck for an hour, then you cold plunge, then you take calls at the house and get some work done before you come in here. You come in here, you work with all the teams, you have meetings, you know, then you have to get your second workout in and then you record the show. Then you're recording the show for hours and hours. Then I'm taking calls again until 10, 11 o'clock at and night. And that's what people don't get is like you. No, they don't here. understand. They, no, they you don't understand. You're here at 6 30 or 7 at night. You come home, you eat. You go in the garage, you take calls, you have people over for whiteboard sessions to help them or teach them, or you have our teams over at night until 10 o'clock at night. People don't see that because obviously like. No, what they think, what they think is a lot is way out of line in reality of what it takes. Exactly. They don't understand how much, like when you say you're fucking busting your balls, that's like, you're, you're not busting them. You're fucking mashing them because you were like, go crazy every single day. And people don't realize that. So for years. Yes. Years and years. Decades now. Yes. Yeah. So like if people can say, I don't have time. And I get personally offended by that. I'm like, are you kidding me? My motherfucking husband works his fucking dick off. Dude, they don't think like that. You got to understand. (sighs) That's not how people think. People don't think that way. They think they look at people like me for the most part. And they say that guy got fucking lucky. 
or that guy had rich parents or that guy fucking hit a trend or he fuck they tell just like you tell yourself why that beer matters or why that food is okay right now or why it's okay to walk around at 350 pounds they tell themselves stories about other people's success the same way and so when 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 i try to tell like the reason i don't talk about this shit is because nobody would believe it anyway like if I told him that, you know what people would say? Look at Frisella promoting hustle, hustle culture. Well, guess what, motherfucker? If you want to build a fucking massive motherfucking company, in fact, a whole bunch of them, uh, you're going to have to hustle. And it's going to take all your fucking time. And that's that. And not everybody wants that. I get that. Not everybody can even do that, even if they wanted it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is what people expect success to take and what it actually takes are, is the difference between fucking that puddle that you had to step over and the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. It's totally, it's, that's how big the difference is of what it takes versus what people think it takes. Mm -hmm. And this goes for people that have careers. This goes for people that are on sports teams. This goes for people that own companies. And this goes for actually putting work into yourself as well. So how do you think that the program has helped you you know, parlay that into the business aspect of, or actually all aspects of your life. You know what I mean? Because again, you're building, you, you know, you built this facility, moved in here. Now you've got two massive buildings going in across the street that are almost done mm -hmm. and then growing all the other companies. So, you know, how do you feel like you've bettered yourself through the program to give into like your employees and your teams? Well, first of all, I'm going to say this, and this is just reality. Like, where, where we're at now, the level that we're playing at now, would not, it would not be possible for me to play at if I hadn't worked on developing that skill set of mental toughness, fortitude, grit, perseverance, self-esteem, self-confidence, understanding that I build my own confidence, mm -hmm. understanding that I build my own self-esteem. Without that understanding, that execution, what I'm doing at this level is impossible. All the people that I compete against at the level that I'm at they're all no, they're, they might not do the same things I do, but these are high performing individuals. These are people that are savage as fuck. Okay. They're not pussies. They're not talking about balance. They're not talking about their fucking journaling and their affirmations and their morning routine and all this shit. They're fucking people who wake the fuck up and go in and crush every single day at a high level. And that's who I'm competing against. Mm -hmm. And so for me to even be on that level, because I, dude, I'm not so, none of these people, by the way, are some gifted people. These are people who earned these skill sets. Yeah. And this, this is the problem. People tell themselves when they look at people like that, that, oh, they were born with that, or they just have that, or they just, th no, they built that. Mm -hmm. And that's what people have to accept as truth. It's reality. And so when we think about, you know, um, the skill sets that we need, like, to, to even compete at a high level, you have to understand that you can get pretty far being how you are, okay? Just by doing some stuff because most people do nothing. But for me to even operate on this level, I have to have those skills. So now it's not an option. It, 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 I'm sorry, it, it makes me think though, because I remember this was probably even a couple of months ago, um, the race team was going to Le Mans. And, you, and my point is, I'm gonna go, come back to my point, but, but you, you were like, man, I wanna go, but do they have a cold tub? Like they ain't got one, I can't go because you got to get your shit done. And I think me looking at you being with you every single day, I see you. What I get is you're you're prioritizing yourself always. Right? And like it's impossible. you have to be selfish to be selfless. You can't you can't accomplish any other stuff. You can't make those calls. And like I've seen it, and we talk about it because yeah. you know we go through your schedules. Like bro, I gotta get my workouts done. I gotta get this done, and then anything else is extra. That's cool. yeah, you know. And I think that's a really important part. Uh, and I think it's something that people misunderstand when it comes to like prioritizing. Yeah, they look at it as an addition to their day mm -hmm. yeah. instead of the day being the addition to their personal development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a different kind of thing. And that's accurate too, bro. I take my ruck everywhere. I fucking operate on 75 hard when I travel anywhere. Ask anybody who's around me. I'll, there'll be a party going on. I'll be like, peace. <laughs> I got to do my outdoor workout. Yep. It is what it is. Um, and that's a mass. that's a massive point. You know, you have to put it at the front. But how has it changed my business? It's fucking changed everything. It taken, it's taken, you know, we went from a fucking, you know, good size, small company to knocking on the door of one of the, you know, bigger, most, yeah. more popular brands out right now yeah. of any, at any level. So 
that's that's where it takes you. It level. It didn't level me up one level. It didn't level me up two levels. It leveled me up fucking thousand levels. Yeah. So those of you guys watching on YouTube, there's um, a, or I'm sorry, if you listen to audio, there's a picture showing right now, and it's Andy at uh, First Form Summer Smash. First one. Yeah, first one, and it's just crazy to see this picture compared to like to see you now because you're on stage with the with the shorts on, with the polo on, and you've got a whole beer in your hand holding it up. And it's just, it's crazy to think about that because like, you know, when you're around someone all the time, you kind of forget those things. Like sometimes Andy and I will text pictures back and forth to each other, like from the old days. And we're like, damn, we looked bad. Cause like we were drink. you could tell we had like that drinking face, like that bloated face. And we Dude, just- Dude, that's like, embarrassing wow. to look at. Like, yeah. Like those people are, I don't know, bro. That's That's just embarrassing. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, you're talking about performing better here, but I think almost nearly everybody under this roof has completed 75 hard at least one time. And I know there's a lot of people in the uh, 75 hard, the official like Facebook community that we have that and people that I I know as well, they get actually their whole teams on board. Like they make it a whole team culture building exercise. To it should be a prerequisite for hiring anybody. It is because that's should the thing be. is the, the people that I know that have done that, that have, you know, had their team sign up and they'll put some like prize on it or something like that for, you know, everybody that completes it or whatever. They just say like, they cannot believe the level of productivity that their companies have now because everybody now raised their standards mm. and them doing it together. That struggle helped you know, build their culture stronger, the people are performing better, the employee, the employer is happier, which makes the employees happier. So it's just people don't realize like the trickle down effect is like you say, you know, you have to be selfish before you're selfish or selfless. But that's exactly what it boils down to is like when you take care of yourself, you're going to be way better for everybody else. And that's like the, you know, that's a wonderful, obviously, byproduct. Of I, that. I couldn't do this without that. Yeah. We, how, we wouldn't exist. How many times I know you've, you've lived this lifestyle since 2019 consistently you've done 75 hard countless times you've done the live hard program every year so I, I i've only completed it two out of the out of the five years there was i mean live hard program's hard to complete yeah i i oh that's right I do. yeah yeah so you've lived this so that's the thing is people don't realize because like, i had surgery one year yes um we had something else now that you say that this is the fifth year so two two of the four years I did it in two of the four years I didn't do it. Yeah, but that's the thing. And then this year I'm going to do it. People don't realize, like you said in the beginning of the show, it's like this is like meant to be done every year because yeah. it's not like one thing where you don't change your oil in your car one time and it's good to go for the rest of the lifetime of that car. Yeah, it's something you do every three thousand miles or whatever to maintain it, and that's what. That's why it's is. a program. Exactly. So dive into those phases a little bit. That's the quote maintenance on the car, if you will. So kind of explain those just a little bit more kind of, I know you said about as far as the Live Hard program, but the phases, those are kind of like you're fine tuning and tweaking. Yeah, so so people have to understand, like it's set up and structured intentionally for intentional reasons. And I have the new book coming out, um, the book on mental toughness mm -hmm. that comes out, I think this year, mm -hmm. um, you would know better than me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, that book explains the phases and the psychology of the phases in detail, as well as, you know, I think a bunch of, you know, it's a shit ton of other content. Like it's an actual book. It's not just it's, the book of the program. It's amazing. Yeah. It's so good. So it, it breaks down all the different aspects of mental toughness, um, why it's necessary, how you develop it. And then it gives you the full psychology of the program in the second part of the book. But uh, basically it works like this. 75 hard is the first 75 days. This is the this is where you're going to do 75 hard. Um, it's going to be extremely difficult. You're going to be extremely sore. Uh, but if you do it, it's going to change a lot in your life. And then you have to realize, like Emily just said, that these skill sets, the skill sets that encompass what we call mental toughness, uh, discipline, grit, fortitude, perseverance, self-esteem, self-confidence, et cetera, these are skill sets that you are either adding to or subtracting from every single day by your actions, all right? So these are perishable skills if you wanna think of them like that. Like for example, if you shoot pistols and you don't shoot regularly, you start to shoot like shit. Uh, those of you that play golf, if you play golf and you hit balls every single day, your swing and everything stays in balance and you can hit the golf ball pretty good. But take a year off, take 30 days off, take 60 days off and then see what happens. Your skill sets when it comes to mental toughness are no different. 
All right. And that's why we have extra phases within the, the year. And this is why they're spaced out as well, which I'll get to in a second. So after 75 hard, which I call the boot camp of the program, and this is where most people know it, right? There's three phases. There's phase one, phase two, and phase three. All right. Got real creative on the na names here. <laughs> phase one is 75 hard plus some additional tasks. Okay. Um, and these additional tasks are designed to make you more uncomfortable and add more to the program. And a lot of people, me included, I like to do phase one immediately on day 76. And so I end up running, uh, you know, what is that? 105 days straight on the program. And what you're doing is once you complete 75 hard, now you're adding in these other tasks that make it even harder. And it's a 30 day, it's 30 days. All right. So that's phase one. Phase two is the exact same tasks that are in the original 75 hard without the extra tasks of phase one. Phase two, there must be a 30 day break at minimum between the end of phase one and the beginning of phase two. And a lot of people are like, why can't you just run them consecutively? Couple reasons. Number one, I make the motherfucking rules of my own program, <laughs> all right? Number two, you have to remember what it's like to not be on the program. Because a program actually isn't any good if it's actually just the program making you strong and making you make the decisions. You have to be able to operate outside the guidelines of the program, and that 30-day break shows you where you are. Do you go right back to your old habits? Do you start back with your laziness? Do you start back with your justifying? And what most people find is that phase two is the hardest phase of the program, even though it's 30 days, even though it's something that they did for 75 days already, because it follows this break of you be going back to reality. All right. So a 30 day break. And a lot of people don't do 30 days. They do 60 days, 90 days, which makes phase two exponentially harder if you have to do it. The, the more you wait, the harder it is. All right. And. So then phase two basically is a big slap in the face of you showing you how off track you actually are and how much work you still have to do. And, uh, and then we have phase three and phase three is, uh, is the hardest phase. Um, when I failed live hard, the two years I failed it, I failed it on phase three because it's a lot of work. And basically for 30 days, you're dedicating your entire life to the fucking program because of the amount of shit that it takes. Uh, you have to be really fucking fine tuned to finish that part of it. But phase three is to be done uh, the 30 days prior to the initial start date of 75 hard the year before. All right. So you begin the year with 75 hard, you end the year with phase three, and then in between there's two phases that you can do at any point in time. And the reason this is all spread out over a year and it's less than half of your year that you're doing this um, is because these are perishable skills. And just like, you know, hitting a golf ball or taking a shower every day, it's necessary to become aware that your discipline, your grit, your fortitude, your perseverance, your mental toughness, your your confidence, your self-esteem are all constantly moving up and down in the amounts that you have them. They don't just go to the top and can stay there when you go back to being a fat, lazy fuck. That's not what, what it happens. What happens is, um, your di what actually happens is, is that your discipline lowers and then you get fat, mm -hmm. right? So when we're talking about how this is all laid out, um, you know, <clears throat> it's a very effective program, which is why it's not a challenge and it's not a fad and it's not a fucking trend. It actually has been growing and, uh, for five years now. So, yeah. so I want to get into some real, the, my favorite topics with 75 hard is let's start with 2021. You had full shoulder surgery like it wasn't just like a little tweak you had basically nothing, yeah, I tore everything every single thing yep. like the worst surgery where i mm -hmm. remember texting your surgeon about you know what was going on he said he goes he goes it is the worst surgery you can have and i he he purposely told us that it was not as bad as it's going to be because he knew you would not want to have the surgery because it was such a fucking brutal terrible yeah. it's like as but it didn't he said it was like as bad as having a hip replacement or worse, I can't remember exactly. I don't know. Name. I don't have never had a hip replacement, no, but I'll tell either, you this. It was fucking horrible. Yeah. You know? So let's talk about where you're, you're talking about the second day when I was home. Yes. And I had you call him and I said, bro, you definitely fucked up my shoulder. <laughs> well, because <laughs> the nerve block well, Andy, off. bro, he, it was so no fucking, block. it he was like pain pills. Yeah. So I don't take pain pills. Yeah. Right. So like 
So like he and and my surgeon, he told me he's like, hey man, you know, uh, you need you need to take these pain pills. I know you don't want to take them, fucking take them. And of course, you know, I'm like, I'm not fucking taking those. And the what nerve block, like vagina, like the shit, the shit fucking wore off, bro. I thought I was gonna die. Yeah. You were you here, were, and then it wore. No, off. No, we went you home. Came yeah. home. I got. I went home. It was eleven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, because yeah. you, you got done with the surgery. You came back up here. We did cardio. Yeah, that's what and I was I gonna get to. But the yeah. next day, yeah. the next day is when I went home early because the nerve block wears off for like twenty four hours. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's gonna say. So like during this recovery, you and I spoke so many times about how, you know, pivotal seventy five hard was in your recovery because I remember saying, you know, like because again, I picked you up from the surgery center, like brought you home and we stopped here so you could get an outdoor workout in. Cause you were like, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna still do this. I gotta get my shit done. So you literally woke up from anesthesia 30 minutes later out doing your walk. Yeah. And during, you know, your recovery, you were always active as much as you could be. Mm -hmm. And I remember us both saying, and I remember telling you like, it was just seeing your change of, if that were 20, 14 Andy having shoulder surgery we talked about how you would have just been on the couch like I'm recovering I, I would have been let's back get to some 350 pizza. let's do this because like yeah. I'm just recovering this was a completely different Andy that I did not know but it's because sunny hard you had like instilled that discipline within yourself and had strengthened it so long already through those few years that the program had already been um in existence so like how do you attribute sunny hard to the recovery process because do you think it helped like i know it helped your mental state to you know because it was a fucking long road to recovery it's worse than that yeah first of all people the the, the day i tore my shoulder i was in the best yeah. physical shape i'd ever been in, in my entire life by a lot. I was I was at I was exactly where I was wanted to be all those times, all those years, all that time I was fat and felt uncomfortable and you know was miserable and wearing the same clothes and turning down parties and turning down beach vacations and being embarrassed of how I looked. I was finally at that point where I was like, dude, this is exactly where I wanted to be. And if you remember, I had just finished 75 hard like three days prior um, because we had an eight week challenge going on at first form and I did 75 hard uh, and it happened to end like right at the same day. And then we went to that trip. Bro, I'll never forget it. Yeah. Like I, like I was, I just told Emily yesterday, I'm like, dude, I, cause I was there when you, when, when it fucking happened. Yeah. And like I, I still have the, like a video recurring in my fucking head when like the, the fucking second it popped. Yeah. I can't get it out of my brain. Yeah, well, that's because it sounded like fucking, I don't know what the fuck that was, sound was, but I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> no, it was horrible. No, fuck no. But anyhow, so there was that, right? So I fucking was at the best place I'd ever been in my life, and then I blast, I tore my shoulder to the point where I couldn't lift my arm over my head. Um, and at that time, there was masking going on. And you guys all know how I feel about my masks and I'm not doing it. Yeah, that's the other episode. Yeah. Other episode. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so none of the places would do an MRI or get me going on surgery unless I was doing the mask and wouldn't do it. So I finally found a guy who I happen to know my whole life. Who's a tremendous surgeon. Who's like, yeah, I'll do it. You know, fuck these people. And I'm like, all right, cool. But that took till December. So months. there was three months here, okay? So now remember, during that three months, by the way, I'm watching my physique deteriorate and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm eating clean, I'm working out, I'm, I'm, I'm training one half of my body, I'm training legs, you know, I'm doing all the things I can do, but dude, like where I was at that level physically cannot be, I was at pinnacle peak, it would be like saying, a. a a guy who plays NFL and he's an all pro player, you know, you can maintain most of that by just, you know, fucking training your leg. Like, dude, it was a complete mental fuck job mm -hmm. watching myself deteriorate after all that work I put in, bro. Mm -hmm. And all that time I spent trying to fix this. And, um, in hindsight, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm through it now. I, I say in the last, it took, it took me 18, 19 months to truly get through the pain and recover. So that's almost two years of not training. And I'm still not all the way back physically to where I was before. 
Like still. See, I think that's a mental fuck. And we talk about this though. I think I think that's still just mental, bro, because I take I know you me I'm close listen, I'm close, but I'm not I'm not there you're, yet. You're very, very I mean yeah, bro, but I think you're there. I know no, I'm not. I Hani says I'm not too. Mm-hmm. So um he thinks I'm about ten percent off. And I agree with that assessment. But the point is, is that like, dude, that's a big mental f- job. And had that been me before, back in 2011 or eight or 10 or whatever, I would have, I would have for sure, I would have sat on the couch. I would have ate shitty. I would have ordered pizzas. I would have drank and I would have been 350 in f- three months. Mm-hmm. And I would have said, oh, I'll get this off. I will get this all off when I heal, when I can start training again. And instead of saying, oh, I'll start Monday, it would have been, I'll start in six months when I'm healthy. Right. And and it would have created a mountain that in my age might have been insurmountable. Yeah. Right. Because it's not like I'm like super young anymore. Right. Like my body, I'm physically young, but I mean, dude, I'm 44 years old. Yeah. Like this shit is not is the same as it was when I was 24. Right. You know, so like that, that tr- truly, I believe me doing that work ahead of that injury I think it saved my whole fucking life. I think it did too. Like yeah. DJ, go back to that picture that was on before this one. So this picture, if you guys are uh, on YouTube, so this was when you were getting out of surgery. You had done your eight week challenge. And you had the best shape of your life, and this is when you started after you were pretty well healed. But I remember us taking this picture, and we were still like happy because you still you could still see some abs and everything. So this is just you doing. Literally just that's just me doing two outdoor or, you know, I did two cardios a day. So I did on the days on I would do my legs every three days and then I would do like one arm, uh, the shit I could do with one arm. Yeah. And then I did on most of the days I did two cardios. So and at that time I wasn't rucking. I was just doing. No, you Yeah. But it's still it's like you look at I, I look at that as where you at when you ended the eight week challenge in 75 hard. And then to this one, when you started again, it's like, yes, there's a difference. But the thing is, is that I it's know. It's a massive it, difference. Dude. Yes. But it's like. We got to throw the picture in there of what we, I we've look got at. it. Okay, yeah. Because yeah, you guys didn't put it up. But what we, but the thing is that I think of this to be your starting point. Whereas if it were years ago, prior to study of hard, this it would be an after photo of a contest instead of actually yeah. like, or, you know, or, yeah. or a challenge or yeah. for the eight week thing. So, um, Okay, so more recent events is which you spoke about so much about, which I know everybody is so happy to do because I even get DMs from people about you sharing your experience of getting yourself off Alexa Pro after mm. being on it for 11 years because people don't realize the damage that it does. They mm. don't realize it while they're in it. It's when they get off of it mm. is when it's bad. Mm. So there were tons of you know ups and downs through that. That was a s- insanely hard year. Dude, listen, I'm going to be real. This is just real talk. And people don't realize this because they see the financial wins. Mm -hmm. Those financial wins were work that I did 10 years ago, five years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm going to be real. September 15th of 2021 till maybe June 1st of this year was probably the hardest fucking time I've ever had in my life for a whole bunch of reasons because a whole bunch of shit hit me all at once. It started with that motherfucking injury and it went into, you know, the the scaling of the company. It went into uh, me getting off Lexapro. Um, and there was a number of other things that happened during that time that were like mentally very fucking destructive and hard to get through. And the reason I, I decided to, to end Lexapro <laughs> literally was because I was at a point with DJ and I doing CTI so much, I was starting to realize how predatory the pharmaceutical industry was because before that, I never really thought about it. I never really thought about how predatory our entire system is towards personal excellence. I just thought, you know, okay, most people are just, you know, regular people and then there's higher people than that, that are above average, then there's great people. And I wanted to be a great person. I wanted to be great in everything that I do. I'm a competitive person. You guys don't realize this. And I don't give a fuck what you spiritual guides have to say on the internet. I'm a competitive motherfucker. If you're friends with me, I'm competing with you. I want to do better than you. I want to be more ripped than you. I want to make more money than you. I want to fucking look more handsome than you. I want to kick more ass than you. But that doesn't mean I don't want that for you. Yeah, I want you to win. I want you to win too, because when you f- 
can win. Yeah. It drives me to win. Right. right. Okay. This is this is actually why my friends are such good friends. Like my friends that I talk to on a regular basis, Honey, Ed, Hermosi, like these dudes are hustlers. They go out and fucking crush. They my brother, you know, the people I surround myself with, it's not that I want them to lose, but I still want to beat them. Right. Okay. And this is how I'm fucking wired. And so for me having to sit on the sidelines and watch all this shit deteriorate away and watch my physical, which I had never been physically in that kind of shape before bro like i'm i'm a fat like my body is a natural endomorphic type physique like i'm a fat dude by by nature i'm strong and i'm athletic but i'm chubby and you know when they say husky jeans motherfucker <laughs> i wore all the husky jeans okay <laughs> like i'm a husky dude and you know the thing is is i had gotten myself to this point where i i i was like dude i'm 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 unfuckable Okay, like I'm killing it in all these areas. And then that injury happened. I think the injury happened to fucking humble me um, because in hindsight, and I'll explain this in a minute, this whole time, which how many months was that? What was that? Fucking September 21 all the way till June of 23. That no. Oh, yeah. To June of 23. Yeah. It's longer than that. It's a it's a year and it's almost two years. Yeah. Um, that whole time was that was a fucking test. Just like I talk about test days on MS CEO project, just that was a life test that I fucking passed. Okay. And the reason I decided to get up and I'm happy about that. Like it's a big fucking win for me. The reason it's probably the biggest win I've ever had in my life. Real talk was getting off. Like no, just getting through that period of time. Like dude, it almost killed me a hundred times. Like you have no, bad. even you don't know. It was bad. Like you don't even really know. Bad. So I decided at that point in July to stop taking Lexapro, which was July of 22, because I had become aware of all the things that we were talking about on the show. And I'm like, these motherfuckers are fucking poisoning my brain, you know? And man, I didn't even know how bad they were poisoning it until I stopped taking that shit. Yeah. And I started having like real withdrawals. Like I had someone message me the other day. They're like, I've been off for seven days. I'm like, and she's like, I can't take it. And I'm like, well, you don't know what you're in for because it fucking gets way worse. And that's just real shit. Like, you better be fucking prepared. And this is why I don't recommend people just stop taking it. In the first 70, 80 days, I was suicidal legitimately by the hour. Like, I was fighting. The withdrawals were so fucking bad. When I say anxiety, when I say paranoia, when I say depression, you guys, and you think of, like, the worst you've ever felt in your life, that's how I felt for... 80 days straight and the only way i got through that was by having the structure of the program real shit because i did 75 hard those first 75 right, days right, okay. um yeah. of of when i stopped and i think that's the only way i made it through it well and i remember there are days that your tasks would be the only thing you could you would yeah to that was it because and i got them done bro such, and I, I, like, I, i'm getting like kind of tears like yeah. thinking about that time because it was so so bad yeah and and it was you know, people don't understand. There's physical symptoms that come from the removal of these drugs. And this is why you, unless you're mentally prepared to deal with it, you should not just quit, okay? You need to build your mental fortitude ahead of time and understand what the fuck you're going to do and have a plan to push through it. Have a support system. I was just gonna you, say, like, listen, if you live alone. You, you should be doing, you should be tuning your mental, your fucking brain up for a year before you decide to fucking just quit it. Yeah. Okay, because you're going to go through some of the worst shit that you're ever going to go through and there's going to be nothing you can do about it. I lost my balance. I had brain zaps. I had brain fog. I had suicidal fucking fantasies. And anybody who's suffered with depression, you know what I'm talking about, where you get a suicidal thought in your brain and it's obsessive. You cannot stop thinking about it. And these things were at the highest possible level that I've ever experienced during this time. And then... Uh, after the first 80 days, it did get better. It got better, but it got better slow. And and I think I think up until about a year of being off of it, which was just recently, I was still having withdrawals because I would still have these ups and downs and these ups and downs. And I think within the last 30 to 60 days is really when I started feeling like myself again, yeah. where I wasn't having this crazy anxiety. And that's also why, that's also a big reason why I sort of withdrew from from my content and a lot of shit. And like, I just didn't feel good, dude. 
You know, I didn't feel like the bad motherfucker that I had been in the past. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I recognized about being on Lexapro, like this is something that like people, like you don't realize this till you come off of it, but it actually makes you immune to the good things in life too. So it numbs you from the bad shit, but it also makes you not care about the good shit. So you don't really ever have any real emotions. And one of the hardest things was like getting used to having emotions again. Like I didn't, I hadn't had them for 11 years. Yeah. So like- I noticed that at Summer Smash. I think that was the first example because I've been with you for four years. Yeah. And that was the first time where I was seeing like genuine raw emotion come through that yeah. like, I have not seen in situations yeah. before. Yeah, well that's because they I was taking their bullshit, Yeah. right? Yeah. And like- their bullshit's real good at making people not give a fuck about anything. So you don't really care that they're taking all your money or propagating you to be a fat, lazy piece of shit or, you know, uh, you know, dividing everybody, all the stuff we talk about on CTIs every day. Right. Um, you don't notice it cause you don't care. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I personally, my personal opinion, you know, obviously there's no scientific evidence to this and that I'm aware of there probably is, but I don't know it. Um, is that they give, I think they give people, I think the reason they're so quick to put people on that shit is ex- explicitly for control of society. Mm-hmm. I think it's a mind control drug. I think they put you on the drug and I think they understand that you're not going to have the lows, but you're also not going to have the highs. So you care a lot less about everything and you're willing to accept what they do to the population, which is make you struggle financially, make you struggle physically with your health, intentionally poison you with chemicals and things in water in the air, like uh, in plastic, like all these things that they do to people, you don't give a fuck about when you don't have any emotion. Right. So like, you know, oh, and dude, the, the other thing that like, how I was prescribed this was so flippant. And so like, it, it was this, I was in the office and my doctor was like, He's like, how are you feeling? And I'm like, well, I'm, f- I don't know. I'm f- I feel like shit. And he's like, well, it's cause you got that business. And I, and I'm like, well, yeah. And he's like, you should sell that business. I'm like, well, I'm not selling the business. And he's like, well, you should just, let me put you on this pill, dude. It'll make you feel better. And like, I was like, oh, all right. I f- started taking it. Yeah. And that's how I got on. Well, there was no. Because that back then you, tr- you would be able to trust a physician. Well, look, and- dude, I don't think that, it w- I don't think that, I, I don't blame him. I just think that's the way it is. No, like, because you, you, that's what I'm saying. That's, now, the, that's the medical system. Bro. Yeah. The, these doctors don't even know what the f*** they're doing. They don't even realize. They're, they're, they're taught, they're taught in an education system that is funded by fucking big pharma. Right. They don't know what the fuck they're doing. That's just what you do when you're a doctor. The studies they right. read. Right, exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. But 11 years ago, we didn't, you know, there's been so much that came out since oh, no, COVID and everything. Yeah. We're, we're all more of like, we're like, skeptical. Wait, let me look. Yeah, we're way yeah. more skeptical. But back then, 11 years ago, if you're a doctor, you would naturally assume that they knew why they were doing this. They had your best interest at heart. Yeah. Not that, hey, take this pill. Listen, and I know for sure. Listen, in. this is not shit talking because my doctor at that time, he's not my doctor anymore was one of my best friend's dads. Right. And he's still a fucking great friend of mine. And I still know that he would, like if I called this dude, I said, hey man, I need to bury a fucking body. Motherfucker would show up. Right. He didn't do it to hurt me. Right. It's just what they do. Mm-hmm. You know? But back to your emotions, I think that's one thing that I noticed the most too, is like, I remember you even saying we were out at the farm, right in the side by side. And you looked at me and you're like, I don't know why I feel like this. Because you weren't used to having like emotions and you were showing emotion again. But as your wife, what was what was cool for me to see is that you were way more engaged in what was happening around you. It wasn't yeah. just like, you know, not that you were like zoned out before, but it's like you actually could tell you were like really listening to every single person that was around and you were way more engaged at events. And that was ha- like- that was hard, though. Yeah. Like that shit's hard. Like when you don't have any emotions for fucking a decade and all of a sudden you're like listening to people like, dude, like for real, this is this is just this is real shit. OK, Um People come up to me all the time and, and and like I'm somewhat well known. Like I get when I go in public, people recognize me. And it's not like a athlete recognize like when you see an athlete, people want to get a picture with the athlete, right? Or you see like the rock, you're like, oh, I saw the rock. I took a picture with him. With me, it's different because of the nature of my content. Mm-hmm. All right. So with me, because I put out personal development so long at a high level that there's lots of people out here who have actually benefited from that content. And when they see me, they want to tell me their story. And when they tell me their story, it's always a good story, but to get to the good part, they got to tell you the worst part. All right. And the worst part is 
you know, I had a fucking gun in my mouth or my fucking wife, you know, uh, died of cancer or my husband, you know, it's always these tr severe, like hardship stories. And they're telling you these stories, but they're telling you these stories so that they can tell you how they overcame these stories mm -hmm. and which I appreciate. Right. But like, dude, let me tell you something. Like when you stand in a meet and greet line for nine fucking hours and you hear a thousand fucking stories like that, bro, it will crush your soul. Mm -hmm. People don't understand that. And so when I was on the fucking medicine, when I was on the pills, I was able to meet these people and hear their story and it didn't really fuck with me too bad. Mm -hmm. Cause like, I didn't want feeling nothing. I was yeah. like, yeah. Well, yeah. Cool I, yeah. no, I, it wasn't like I was detached, but I was detached. Like I was like, I was like, man, that's really, that's, that's horrible. Like, like that, I didn't feel it. Yeah. Okay. But what I've noticed now, and this is also why I can't do a lot of these meet and greet type things anymore is that like, dude, the shit really affects me. So like when someone is standing in front of me or telling me one of these stories, now it like fucks me up. Right. And that's one of the biggest things that, that I realize. And a lot of people say, Oh, that's a great thing. Yeah, it is. Except for when you have to do it a thousand times right. in a row. Yeah. It was just two or three. Yeah. Times. Well, it, it's cool. carrying a heavy load. No, dude, listen, dude, people don't understand. And, and this is not disrespectful because I'm very appreciative of, of the, the fan base and the following. I can dude, this is not disrespect, but what's happening to me in those times is I'm getting every single person's worth worst fucking story emotionally dumped on me mm -hmm. and and in a in a in a in a in, in a an action of gratitude right mm -hmm. and so like but that shit still fucks you up and so you know and that happens to me every day it happens to yeah. me in my dms it happens to me in my conversations with people like phone calls i can't escape you. it right. like and it's really fucking difficult to manage and people think you know, because I kind of withdraw myself from a lot of situations, dude, I'm just protecting my fucking energy. Yeah. Like I can't fucking be dumped on like that and operate my life. Like I'm not a fucking professional dumpster. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm sorry you're having a problem. I've dedicated a big part of my life to giving free content to help you help yourself. Right. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. And so, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but the point is, is that like I started feeling those things and feeling things that I hadn't felt in so many years made me realize how bad that shit was for me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because I I know people personally that are on, they are on the quarter of the amount of dose that you were on and they try, they've try they tried to get off several times. They're like, I can't deal with the withdrawals. Like, And they say, like, I don't know how the, how the fuck you did this. And I was like, and I tell them, I'm like, it's through the discipline. You've got to have a structure to it. And I think that's the way. I just decided I was fucking done. Yeah. Exactly. And, done. Yeah. And I know there's people that you and I both know mutually that have followed your lead on that to get off of that. And they feel they they say the same thing. It's like, even though they were on a very, very low dose, they're like, I wanted to kill myself every day. Like even just the, the smallest amount you can get is what this drug is doing. People don't understand that, dude. Yeah. Like because victimization has become popular in society mm -hmm. and when people, you know, now and unfortunately, you know, people talking about killing themselves in public has become almost like a virtue signal, all mm -hmm. right? Um, pe pe a lot, I think a lot of people are desensitized to the real feelings of that, like what we're really talking about. Mm -hmm. Like when you're talking about suicidal thoughts, you're not, you're not there yet, bro, until you're planning it and you're like, how do I do this with nobody finding out? Or how do I do this with minimal disruption? Or how do I do this so Emily doesn't have to clean up my brains on the fucking floor? Like that's when you start to fucking, that's when you're in that place. Okay. When you, when you're having, when, when your pistol is in your nightstand and all you can think about is pulling it out of your nightstand and fucking blowing your brains out every single fucking other minute you're starting to have, and, and it doesn't sound bad. Like it doesn't sound like, Oh, I'm scared of this. It sounds like, damn dude, I just kind of want to do this. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's a, it's a different thing. And like, because society has become so soft and I'm not sitting here saying you're valid or not valid. or I don't give a fuck. What I'm saying is victim culture has become this thing on social media where everybody who's having a hard time talks about wanting to end their life. Or I, I, I almost wanted to kill myself one time. Dude, people shouldn't say those things unless it's actually true because it waters down and you can't identify who's actually struggling anymore. Yeah. And so there's levels to like, 
life. And sometimes life is just fucking hard. But when I explain suicidal fantasies and tendencies, that's what I'm talking about. But what about the glamorization of pharmaceuticals? Because that's kind of, I feel like that's also a huge crutch in society. It's not just the victimhood, but it's the glamorization of the wine mom brunchers and, hey, let's pop a Xanax and go to this. And it's like, it's, you know, and I've seen designers come out with, you know, um, like Adderall, like fancy rhinestone Adderall. Yeah, it becomes a part bad. of their identity. Yeah, and like these, you know, wine was like, oh, I got it. I'm taking kids are out of summer, you know, and be taking a Xanax bar every day. It's like they make it. They try to make it trendy. Well, other drugs are like that too. I, I know. I mean, other people, you know, they do that with weed. You know, they make it part of their identity. You do it with alcohol. But you do it right. I've, I know, but I'm. I, I've I'm done those the pharmaceutical things. Pharmaceutical aspect yeah. of it, though. That's what I think about. You know what I mean? It's like it's just it's just it's tribe behavior. Yeah, it's just. I don't know, I just uh, it's dangerous. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, okay, so let's talk about you being you say you're chubby, you're naturally husky, fat. So let's talk about that. Big bone. Uh well, I mean that's no. that's you ever no, I'm not, that? big bone. I mean, that's so, that was like a old that was like when we were young, like that was like what people said. Big yeah. bone. You're not fat, you're just big bone. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. And I like when they do the x-rays and everybody's bones are like the same size. <laughs> Okay, so what I want to talk about, though, is that I love, and this is why I have my little documentation here. So your cardiologist is fucking fantastic. He's absolutely amazing. Just love him. Yep, he is. And so you had, you know, you, we, we both regularly get our labs done, get our blood work done, and I'm not going to go into it, but I have a 13-page analysis here from your mm -hmm. labs. But the cool thing about this is this happened um, very beginning of the year when we had our your last labs done that we discovered this, is that... You know, and you've always joked around like, oh, I got the fat gene. I got the fat gene. You know, just like what people say, like the husky, the big bone. But, but I actually had it. You actually. <laughs> no, 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 you did not. I had all of you them. You did not have a fat gene. Yeah. You actually tested to have every fat gene. Yeah. So him it's saying crazy. that for all these years, we found out he actually has every single one, which is very rare for someone to have every single fat gene. And that's, so that's the problem, bro. That's what I got. Yeah. Is it? I got the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have the unfunny gene. So the. Uh, but no. you, you guys can battle over who has the least trophies. I'm just saying I got two of them. Me and Madonna keep them to ourselves. I got two of them right there. I don't see Emily's up there. No, those are those are trophies. How many, you, how many episodes you've been on? Motherfucker, those are trophies you used to have. You're yeah. on probation. They're getting, <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting recycled to me now. Yeah, I don't know about that either. <laughs> you want to have dinner tonight? <laughs> you what you got going on for dinner, Madonna? <laughs> 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 hey, 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 yeah. hey, I'm making lasagna. Motherfucker. I can, go, I can go to a restaurant and eat whatever I want now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so this page, it's 13 pages long of the fat genes, okay? And all your your things. So I was texting him and I said, what are like, tell me what these fat genes are. And he said the two, the main ones that just extracted from this uh, lab report. Now, I always thought this was bullshit. I didn't realize fat gene was a real thing. Dude, I, yeah, same. I thought it was, thought it was show, bullshit. Show the fat gene, show, show the restaurant again. So that's the the infamous Under Armour polo as well. Yeah. Too. So it's just. But see, that's just, the thing, bro. You look like I wouldn't want to fuck with that guy. Like he just looks. No, I, I was just beefy. I yeah, but I was fucking fat. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm saying. I was strong, but I was fat. I was obese. Like my yeah. shit didn't. Dude, I was wearing a 44 pants there, bro. It's crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's 10 inches of fucking pants bigger than what I wear now. It's yeah. crazy. So the two main fat genes are FTO and MC4R. So the polygenic means more than one gene is affecting the phenotype and that higher, you know, higher the risk score and the more likely the person is to have that condition. So with a risk score of like 79, the person is way more likely to be obese. And epigenics is how your lifestyle interacts with your genes and turns them on or off. So changing to a higher protein diet with more physical activity was enough for you to turn these genes off. And this is like a text directly from your doctor saying, hey, you guess what? If you can work out and you eat good and have a high protein diet. You can defeat your genetics. Yes. And what is, well, you know what? He also verified that too, because I said, oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. You know, blah, blah. And, he, and then he texts this. It says, no worries, 75 hard versus genes. Guess who wins? <laughs> because he knows the program and how well it works. And so with us like joking about you having the fat gene, I remember you coming home and telling me that because he's awesome. He came here to give you your, all your mm. results and everything. And you were like, you're not going to believe this. And I was like, what? You're like, I don't have a fat gene. I fucking have all of them. <laughs> And I was like, no way. And it just goes to show you like how well the program works and just, just getting your 
fucking shit on track. You know what I mean? And taking responsibility for your own life because so many people, like you said, it's like they don't have time or they don't have the discipline. Well, or those like, genes, oh, I mean, in, in, in all fairness, let's be real. It's not the program didn't defeat those genes. My physical health defeated those genes, okay? And the way I got the physical health was by using the program to fix my brain. Yeah. Okay, so that that the that the actions that I was taking have been consistent enough over the course of time to actually switch those genes into the off position. Right. So like just doing the program one time is not no, going to uh, yeah, fix good. your genetic makeup. Yeah. But if you fix your brain, which allows you to fix your lifestyle, that allows you to fix your health, then you end up with, you know, some of these kind of changes that we're talking about that are that are real. Yeah. And I think and if you really think about that in the scope of this, suddenly have hard being around for, you know, five years now and you having these results from doing the program at the time that the you know, so it was, you know, four years you had done the program and live that lifestyle consistently by fixing your mindset to get your body right and everything else that, you know, came along with that is that if you really think about it, I mean, four years, that's not a lot of investment at all to literally fix yourself in that regard. You know, well, you need to continue that. Yeah, but see, here's the thing that you got to remember. <clears throat> when most people diet, dude, when you're like, when you're like overweight or like obese or fat or however you want to say it, um, all you want, like you would, like you would give every fucking thing that you own to be physically where you wanted to be at that time. Mm -hmm. Like there's not a person right now who's like super overweight who if I said, bro, I'll you give me everything you fucking have. Give me all your money. Give me your house. Give me a fucking, give me your cat and your dog. And I'll snap my fingers and fucking right now you will go to your ideal physical self. You, all your clothes will fit. All your clothes will look good. You will look amazing. Every single person will take that deal if you could fucking snap your fingers and make it happen. That's how bad of a desire that these people want to change. And where they fail to realize the change actually happens is in your mind first. You have to condition your mind to be able to adhere so that you can then change your health. And these things do not compute to people because of the way the weight loss industry and uh, the pharma industry and everybody markets weight loss. Like, let's look at the marketing of most weight loss for the course of history. Most of it is take this pill and you'll lose weight. Mm -hmm. Take this drug and you'll lose weight. Take this and you'll get there. Nobody's out there except me. And maybe, you know, I think the fitness culture has definitely shifted to this now, but it started with first form saying, hey, we do the work. Mm -hmm. Okay. That started in 2014. That was a major initiative of our brand was to change the mentality around the marketing of weight loss. And the reason that we wanted to change the marketing around the mentality of weight loss is because it's a fucking lie. And it was a lie for years and years and years and years and years. The idea of taking a pill or taking a product or getting a shot and you just becoming this version of yourself is bullshit. All right. And it's no different than someone who wins the Powerball lottery and is broke in two years mm -hmm. because you don't have the financial skill set to maintain responsibly that amount of wealth. And so that wealth leaves you. And so even if you were able to take a pill, even if you were able to take Ozempic, all right, and get lose 15% of your body weight, um, the minute you stop, the habits that you have are going to take you right back where you, where you were. And it's going to make you unhappy. Mm -hmm. So when we look at like four years, you say, okay, that's not a lot of investment for four years. Well, what if... What if in 75 days you could do enough work to get most of the way there physically mm -hmm. and create the awareness mentally of what actually the problem is? Now you're in a much better position. Now not only have you gotten in pretty good physical shape because most people can make tremendous improvements in 75 days. Uh, maybe it takes you a hundred, maybe it takes you two cycles, but very few people are outside the realm of 150 day transformation unless you're 600 pounds. Right. Okay. So we're talking about a very short amount of investment to create most of the physical results that you're trying to achieve that you would sell your fucking dog to achieve. Mm -hmm. All right. If someone could snap your fingers, you can do that in 75 days. And now you're in a position where not only are you most of the way there physically, but you actually understand the game mentally. And you may not be fixed mentally and because no one's fixed mentally. 
but you understand these are perishable skills. I have to work on them. I have to go hit my mental golf balls every day if I want to golf well, right? So I have to exercise discipline. I have to exercise grit. I have to push through these hard times because by pushing through these hard times, it equips me to push through hard times, okay? And I had a guitar teacher one time tell me, he says, Andy, you're the least patient uh, person I've ever met. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? He goes, well, I want you to practice patience. I said, how do you practice patience? He says, by doing things that require patience. All right. And discipline's no different. Grit's no different. Perseverance is no different. Okay. You have to put the time into these hard things so that you understand that you have the ability to do hard things. And then the next time the hard things show up, you have the confidence, which builds your confidence, builds your self-esteem to actually push through the hard times to continue on the path of what you told yourself you were going to do. And when you can do what you tell yourself you're going to do, your confidence goes up, your self-esteem goes up, your self-worth goes up, and you understand that you are actually in control of your life when before you thought that you weren't. You were looking at everybody else who is successful, you're looking at everybody else who's fit, you're looking at everybody else and you're telling yourself a story. You're saying, that guy's fit because he has better genetics. That person's successful because they got lucky, not because they work from the time they wake up till the time they go to bed, right? Like we tell ourselves all these stories. And once you remove those stories, because you are aware now, you are starting to aware that, holy shit, this is actually, it actually becomes a whole new game. Now your life opens up to you. You become aware that whatever plan you set forth in front of you, you can achieve because you have the ability to adhere and you have, you know what to do when the hard times come. And here's the thing about life. Guess what? It's yin and yang. And if yin represents the good times and yang represents the bad times, how much percentage does that represent of the bad times, the hard times? 50 fucking percent. And if you fucking flake out on 50% of your life because it's fucking hard, you're going to lose. That's reality. You're going to live a life in a body you hate. You're going to live a life with the income you hate. You're going to live a life with relationships that you hate. You're going to live a life that you fucking hate because you lack the skill set, which, as we talked about, are perishable to actually adhere to the plan in front of you. So you have two choices. Your choice is either you can become all powerful and fucking have the ability to adhere no matter what the plan is, or you can float through life like a trash bag in the wind and you can take the good times when they come and you can take the bad times when you come. Personally, I want to be in control of most of the shit that I have going on. I think that's where the jam is. If you're one of these granola people and you want to float through life and live in a fucking van and think this is all great, post on social media all the time and have zero discipline and all this shit and then pretend like you're cool with it and then in 10 years when your life sucks, that's cool too. I don't give a shit because it ain't me. All right. But I'm just telling you right now, if you're struggling right now with you getting your life on track and you're struggling with becoming that version of yourself that you know exists inside your mind and your heart. And you're not understanding that things that other people have are actually skill sets that you just haven't developed. Understand that first and then go develop them. Because once you develop them, and once you go through this process of self-development and awareness, now you're in a position to adhere to whatever you put in front of you. And if you could follow any plan that you put in front of you, what are the limits on your life? There are none. So what I want to touch on and go back to is you said you said awareness and I had that I wanted to touch on that. So the self-awareness and, you know, you're removing these stories from your life. I think one massive component that is overlooked as far as, you know, propelling your life and excelling and enriching yourself in all aspects of it. It's not just you're getting your, your mentality, but I feel like your self-awareness is so heightened that now you realize all the bullshit stories people are telling themselves. Uh -huh. And you also ex are starting to like extract people from your life that you're like, I don't want that anymore because now I am at a heightened awareness. I've got my, you know, I'm working on getting my shit together. I'm gonna continue to work on getting my shit together. They're not. And it's it's a turnoff for you to be like almost associated or friends with them anymore because you're like, what was I doing? I was living in a fog. You know, I, I hear that a lot of people. And I've, no, I've dude, as well. two things that are gonna happen. 
over the course of this development that you should probably be prepared for. Number one, you're gonna realize that you're a fucking liar. You lie to yourself all the time, especially about the amount of time that you have. You're going to say, oh, I don't have time to do this. And then you're gonna start doing this and you're gonna be like, dude, I was totally lying. Like I have all this time. And now, way I, more time. now I actually have more time because I'm organized, I'm mm -hmm. executing. Okay, so that's the first thing. You're gonna realize that you're full of shit. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. I don't say that in a bad way. You, Everybody here needs to realize that you're full of shit. Okay, because once you realize you're full of shit, you can work on not being full of shit. All right? <laughs> so, but the second thing that's gonna happen is that your ability to tolerate excuses and your ability to tolerate mediocrity and your ability to be around people who are just like the normal type person where it's like, it, come on, man, what difference does it make? Just have one beer and hang out with it. Bro, I cannot have those people around me. I fucking cannot stand, because I don't hear anything other than you're just the weakest fucking bitch that I've ever met in my entire life. Mm -hmm. That's all I hear coming out of your mouth. Yep. Like, I don't hear, oh, these guys love me and they want to have a good time. I hear my friend, who I thought was fucking one way, is actually a fucking pussy. That's what I hear, and I can't be around it. What I tell you last night, what my biggest fucking source of unhappiness in my life is. It's people that are complacent and not driven. I cannot surround myself. I cannot be around anyone, whether it be on this team, whether it be on my point of contacts, on, on the board of First Form, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm involved in, if I am around people who are complacent, if I am around people who are not driven at a high level, it makes me angry and miserable because that's how I run. I run at a high level. I love, whether you think it's right or wrong, that's me, okay? I don't give a shit what you want. I don't give a shit what you think. I am unhappy being around anything less than that. It has to be that. Otherwise, I can't be around you. Yeah. I just can't do it. And, you know, people say, well, that sounds pretty fucked up. Well, I'm sure it does because you think that it's okay to drink beer fucking 10 o'clock till fucking 8 o'clock at night every Saturday and Sunday and fuck off your life away. I'm sure it sounds fucked up to you. But here's the thing, though. It's like... The, those people want to do that with you and they say, oh, dude, just relax, blah, blah. It's like, but then they compliment you on the shit that you have achieved. So it's like, which way is it going to, you know what I mean? Like, which way is it going to be? And it's no I, bro, I can't even talk to people. Mo it's most no, but it's no coincidence where, um, you know, life was back in 2009 to where it is now and how your mental development and, you know, developing that mental toughness has been able to get you, you know, to the point where you are today. And a lot of people just be quick to discount that again, like the lucky or, oh, you know, he's had this, which you've never had any fucking funding. You had to build everything yourself. So I think with when people like that, your friends are like always dogging on you or trying to like, hey, man, just come out with us. You never go out. But the thing is, it's that's I think what study of heart has done for me, too. It's raising that awareness of realizing like, you know, and I, I do not want to say like this is going to sound bad. But it's like. I, I kind of feel better like, hey, you know what? I'm doing shit that you're not. You know what I mean? Like I'm doing the stuff that you're you're going to go out and drink and post I, on your story. I'll say that. I take and, pride in that shit. That's just no different than when fucking I saw uh, one of, somebody that you all know. I'm not going to say his name because I'm not going to embarrass people. But, you know, some dude fucking posted on my, uh, uh, I, I, I do my cold plunge at 35 degrees. Okay. Oh, yeah. There's no physical benefit to 35 degrees. All right. Um. You're going to get the same physical benefit at 50 degrees that you get at 35 degrees. Yeah. All right. So I unplug the heating element on my cold plunge and then I plug the chiller directly into its own outlet and I can get the fucking thing to go to 35. All right. And it's highly not recommended by the factory because it'll burn your chiller out. But guess what? I'm rich and I can buy another chiller if it burns out. All right. That's reality. <laughs> no, because he was literally like, how do I get this thing colder? So, how do I, get so I don't give a fuck. So when it burns out, I can buy another one. In fact, I'm pretty sure they'll give me one because I've sold more cold plunges for them than That's any true. of their influencers. That's true. <laughs> okay. So the reality is <clears throat> I do it at 35 and I posted it one day and I get this message from somebody that you all know who's like, you know, the physical benefits are only blah, 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 blah. And you know what I fucking thought in my head? That's why I'm me and you're you, bitch. Yep. Yep. That's why you're, that's why you're watching my shit and I'm not watching your shit. That's why you're learning from me and I'm not learning from you because I do shit and take pride in shit that other motherfuckers will not do or refuse to do or can't do and I love it and it makes me feel great and if that makes you offended, I don't give a shit because it makes me feel awesome. Yeah. I take well, pride I in it. Everybody's you, like that. It's just about putting yourself in those situations to, to develop that, right? Like, we I'm proud out, of that. We're going to walk out in the fucking snow in two feet of snow. No one's doing that. 
you know, but bro, when we're out there in two feet of snow, like that, dude, That's pretty fucking DJ cool. and I did a cardio <laughs> session a year, two years ago. Yeah. We had 18 inches of snow and it was fucking, I don't know how many minus it was minus degrees. It was, I think it was minus 10 or 15 or something. And wind was blowing. It was cold. It was cold <laughs> as fuck. And it was 18 inches of snow and we had to do our norm. We, we, we got, we got 45 minutes in and we were halfway on our normal route, which means we, we were, we were our same route that would take us 45 minutes was going now going to take us an hour and a half. Yeah. And we realized that about 25% uh, in. So we were like, okay. And we had a conversation, remember? Mm -hmm. And we said, you just turn around. We said, we said, should we just turn around here? Because we turn around here, it'll be 45 minutes. And then we were both like, no, fuck it. Mm -hmm. We're doing the whole route. And so we did an hour and a half in a fucking 18 inches of snow in minus degrees. And you know what? When I open my phone, you know what my friends are doing? Playing fucking golf. Yep. Hot chocolate. You know what my friends are doing? Yeah. They're on fucking vacation in fucking Italy. You know, you know what? You know what I thought? This is why I'm fucking winning, bitch. Well, and here's the thing though, because even at events that you go to, they ask me, like, dude, is, is he always like that? They try to they try to like probe me for yeah. info about him. Same. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's fucking how he is all the time. Yeah. And they're like, there might be some people that do more extreme shit. Like Goggins running 245 miles and shit. I'm not doing that kind of shit. Setting, you know, yeah. putting out fires. I, I'm I'm just saying the consistency in which you operate is unmatched and i do always have i've always kind of found that kind of comical when the get these guys would be like oh yeah so because they may not know me because we don't like post our soldier and they're no like, they're trying to see what what he's like dude they're like, every, what, what, so no, what's he really, really like? everybody says that the most fucking, like, what's what's he really it's like so yeah. annoying and people in my dms are asking me it's like so what's it like to live with andy like is he really like that i'm like Yes, he <laughs> operates at that level all the fucking time, and it's just they're they're like oh, I can't even believe that you know, or they think like he's. But wait, like, wait, here's what I don't understand. I have to. I don't have a the choice. Shit you're doing it's it's. Required. I don't have a choice. You can't do what I'm doing and not be that way. Right. That's what they don't get. Yeah, like it's a it's not me trying to like be a hard ass. Maybe there's other people out here who can run at that level. And fuck off. There is. There's lots of people that have bigger companies than me, that are higher skilled than me, that are smarter than me, that have done way more than me. And, and they don't work as hard as I do. Okay. Those people, I'm not one of those people. I'm saying for me, I'm a regular person that comes from regular life. I have to do that shit. That's why I do it. I don't have a choice. I have to do it. Well, plus, I think one differentiating factor is people may not realize you're not, you know, you don't own this company and own it from your house, meaning you're active here every fucking day. You're in the office seven days a week. People don't realize that. You know what I mean? So that's, I think, where that 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 awe comes in because people that may, you know, be more, quote, successful or whatever it is or, you know, further along or whatever it might be, they are not actually active in their companies anymore. No. And then not only that, they try to like, they try to like, it's funny because they try to justify their shit to me they're like you know i'm just in a different season of life you know <laughs> no i'm being for real it's, it's called being on the couch no season. listen this is what people say <laughs> the people above me that that or at my level that don't want to work that hard they say well i'm just in a different season that's what they say mm. the people below me what they say is well i want more balance in my life i want a different life and so Priorities. yeah that's right and that's okay that's cool. but it's only okay when it's true it's not okay when you're just justifying your lack of ability to actually pour into yourself, develop yourself, and become that version of yourself that you actually truly want. You want to know how you fuck up your whole life? You take that version of yourself that you imagine in your heart and your mind, that ultimate version of yourself, and then when it gets hard, you you throw that dream away and you say, I never wanted that dream in the first place, and you settle with some bullshit life. Okay, that you didn't really want and then pretend you wanted it. That's how you fuck up your whole life. And that's what a lot of people do. And I'm not judging anybody. I'm not saying you, because listen, this ain't for everybody. This is why it said ain't for, not for everybody in my Instagram bio since 2012. I'm not for everybody. My goals aren't for everybody. My dreams aren't for everybody. My personality's not for everybody. My work ethic's not for everybody. And I'm okay with that. I understand that. But when you throw your own shit away, because you don't want to fucking become who it is you have to become to achieve that. And you instead adopt this other life because you see people on Instagram or you see people living this carefree life or this more fun life and you throw away those dreams and then you put this new thing in there, you're going to hate yourself your entire life.
You're going to have fun for a few weeks, maybe a few months, maybe even a year. But after a while, that version of yourself that you know you're supposed to become is going to creep back into your mind and into your heart. And you're going to have tons of regret about not willing, not being willing to put in what it took to actually create that. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to fuck you up. That's how people ruin their lives. Well, one thing I like about with balance, you know, because I've never believed in balance. I never really saw that growing up because, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur as well. He's still the hardest working dude I know. <laughs> yeah. He's what is 70. he almost 70? Yeah. But one thing, a uh, quote that I like that Tim Grover says is like, when you have balance, it, the scale's at zero. Nothing's happening when actually bolt the scale's balanced, it's zero. So these people that want balance in their life, I always ask them, well, what have you done to make you want to have that balance? Because so many people just think balance is almost like, it, it's a trend like, oh, I need to have 50% of my time with my family and 50% at work. But how how have you gone like run through the finish line to see that it's, it's extreme to where, wait, I need to I need to kind of pull back the reins a little bit to have that balance. I think a lot of people have this idea of balance instead of actually like testing what is my balance going to be. You know what I think? What? I think people need to stop judging people on how the fuck they live. Yeah. That's what I think. I think if you want a certain outcome, it's going to take a certain amount of effort. And that's reality. If right. you want to travel the world in a van and go camping and that's all you want to do, that's not going to take a whole lot. Yeah. All right. If you want to build a multi-billion dollar operation uh, that changes people's lives, that's going to go down in history as one of the f-ing great iconic American companies, that's going to take a little bit more than living in your f-ing van. Right. OK. And, and then there's levels in between. The ultimate lesson here is this. Everybody's on their own path. And I don't want to judge someone for wanting to be free and easy. I just want you to understand that there's a cost to that. And the cost that you're going to have to that isn't going to come until later. All right. So really the truth is most people need to shut the fuck up and focus on that version of themselves they want to become and actually be willing to become it. And that's what's ultimately going to create the fulfillment that you're looking for. It's not going to be your cold plunge. It's not going to be your morning routine. It's not going to be your journaling. It's not going to be your grounding. It's not going to be your granola lunch. It's not going to be you living in the fucking van. It's not going to be your therapy. It's going to be the work that you fucking do to become that version of yourself that is the exact version that you know you're supposed to become and then being proud of it. That's what's going to create the fulfillment that you're searching for. And all of this other shit is just band-aid shit to try and fix something that you know is a real problem in yourself. Mm-hmm. Love that, man. Yeah. So uh, for those that have not done 75 hard, and we talked about day 76, you know, you go right into phase one on day 76. Usually, yeah. Yeah. So what do you wish, because I this is a lot that I see in the Facebook group, is that everybody's always like day 76 and they want to go right into phase one because they're like, I, and a lot, what of it is, is like some people, like as they get to the program first, they might, you know, start to complete the program because they want a physical transformation or something. Or a lot of them, you know, it's, I feel it's like 50, 50. They want that mental, that mental, uh, you know, element to it. But what I see a lot on is when people get close to 76, they don't want it to end because they love the way they feel so much and they love the structure because, again, what we touched on earlier is they realize how much time they've actually been wasting. And people, I love the group because I go in there like every day and read the stuff, but they call themselves out like, I was full of shit. Like, I can't believe that I got this, you know, where they're at in life whatever, by being so full of shit. And then I love when they share like their wins, like you were talked about. Um, people losing a lot of weight, like after, you know, a, a majority of their weight, like in the first 75 days, or maybe it takes two rounds. There was a gentleman yesterday uh, that I shared in here with the team that he had done two rounds of 75 hard in a year and he lost 130 pounds. A yeah. completely fucking different person. Yeah. Like and he's got a picture of the kids and you can just the see it on their face and their eyes, like how proud of themselves because they realized they've been telling themselves bullshit lies for a really, really long time. Yeah. And they finally have their head above water and realizing like, I can do a whole lot fucking more. That's the life. awareness I'm talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, DJ, you got anything else to wrap this up before I share the next aspect of this with Andy and I? No. Okay. So let's tell people like, cause, cause I'm starting 75 hard on Monday and you are going to be starting phase two. I'm starting phase two. I have phase two of my program that starts Monday. Emily's starting 75 hard. DJ starting 75 hard. And a whole bunch of our friends are starting 75 hard as well. Um, I'll probably, usually every year, I usually do 75 hard twice. And what I normally do is when I finish phase two, I just keep going all the way through 75, which is what my plan is this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're starting 75, DJ starting 75. Uh, that group that we know is starting yeah. 75. Yeah. Um, and then I'm starting phase two, which I'll probably complete a 75. Yeah. yeah. 
And so we want you guys to join us on this. I think it's going to be fun to see because we always like to see everybody posting and sharing. So we're going to start um, August 28th, which is Monday, and then 75 days will take us to November 11th. And so what we want you guys to do is like document this because you and I love seeing people post that and share it. And we search the hashtags and stuff like that. So share with us on like Instagram, TikTok, wherever on social media platform and make sure you use hashtag 75 hard. Um, tag us in this. And so then after November 11th, when 75 days is over, you're going to have one week to send us email in your uh, transformation and then also like a 2000 word little blurb about like how you're feeling, what it's done for you uh, the most through the program. 2,000 max word. Yes, 2,000 max word. So we can um, read everybody's stories. And you're going to be emailing that to 75hard at andyforsella.com. After you submit your submissions in to 75hard at andyforsella.com, we're going to have a panel of judges, not Andy or I, go through and choose one guy and one girl that best documented their 75 hard journey. And what they're going to win is a all expense paid trip to St. Louis to he First Form Headquarters. You're going to be on the podcast with Andy to talk about your experience doing 75 Hard. You're going to get a 75 Hard workout done with Andy here. Um, you're going to get Andy's 75 Hard First Form uh, supplement stack that he always uses. And then you're going to go to dinner with us. So make sure you guys uh, let us know if you're starting in the comments below. Again, we're starting August 28th. We'll wrap up November 11th. Then you guys will have one week to submit everything. And then we'll bring you out here in December. I should just be like, these. Yeah, look at that. This is doing good. <laughs> Get down in the comments, you guys, and uh, be a give, more soul. give us some. Tell me how much more you like me than DJ. And... Who's the bigger dork? <laughs> is it DJ or Emily? Let me know in the comments. Hey, <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, I don't care. I don't care. I left my own joke, so I'm funny. I'll give myself Same. trophies. Yeah, yeah, I I'm on Amazon buying me some right now. <laughs> but yeah, guys, so join us on this with 75 Hard. Uh, let us see what you got. And make sure if you are uh, doing this with us, if you're Live Hard, 75 Hard, whatever, make sure you join the Facebook group too because I love to see you guys in there too to connect. And there's a ton of help and support in that uh, network as well. So, and fuck off for you nodding that at me about being a dork so <laughs> we have to put that in the video yeah. see not, not over. Yeah. i know what an asshole <laughs> it's fired oh, well, no he's not to, don't want to point <laughs> <laughs> this is hate speech <laughs> all right guys um that's the show no <laughs> sure. don't be a hoe don't, don't be, be an hoe. emily and share the show <laughs> You gonna laugh some more at your own joke? Yeah, there's no trophy. <laughs> wow, this got really bad. No, it's really great. We're just getting going. Keep going. <laughs> Guys, if you want to know what the program is, go to episode 208. It's available for free. It'll give you all the breakdown of the whole Live Hard program, explain 75 hard. Um, there is a book available. It's not necessary for you to buy. It's on my website, andyforsella.com. It'll give you the whole rundown of 75 hard. Uh, it does not have the live hard phases in it. Uh, the live hard phases are available exclusively on the episode 208 for free. That's audio feed only, by the way. We weren't on YouTube back then. So yeah. uh, go check that out, get it for free and uh, join us. Yeah, and I also think if you guys are doing this, definitely, I highly recommend getting the 75 Hard app. It's on Android and uh, iTunes because you can actually set timers in that and like alerts. So like if it's you go to bed usually at 10 o'clock, you could set an alert at 10 o'clock to make sure you took your picture, or you finished your water or whatever, because mm -hmm. it eliminates you guys from forgetting anything. You take your pictures in there. It'll do like a slideshow for you. It's been great. I've used it every time I've done it since we came out with the app. So definitely check out the app for sure. It's just 75 Hard. So. All right. Bye. <laughs>